Thank you very much. And quite delighted to be here. I'm going to have a very simple paper, but I uh, need to read it just to, for the sake of time. Uh, Whenever I return to Mali, I'm from Mali, I'm uh, a Malian, I find myself confronted with what MS Césaire called a proud and insolent poverty. Men and women who are still guided by an opaque world do not hesitate to invite me in a, and reconnect with the world to which I had turned my back. I hear the voices in this poem by Césaire entitled Appel aux Magiciens. From all our machines put together, from all our roads charted in miles, from all our accumulated tonnage, from all our arrayed aeroplanes, from all our regulations, from all our conditioning, not the slightest feeling could emerge. That is of another order, and real, and infinitely more exalted. From all your manufactured thoughts, from all your graded concepts, from all your concerted measures, not the slightest frisson of genuine civilization could result. That is of another order, infinitely more exalted, and sur rational or above rationality. I cannot stop admiring the great Caribbean silence, our insolent wealth, our cynical poverty. You have encircled the world. You have yet to embrace it warmly. True civilizations are poetic sharks, the sharks of the stars, of the sun, of the plant, of the animal, the shark of the round globe, of the rain, of the light, of numbers, the shark of life, the shark of death. Since, since the sun temple, since the mask, since the Indian, since the African man, too much distance has been calculated here, has been granted here between things and ourselves. Uh, this is a Michael Richardson's translation and I think it's fairly faithful. Césaire's narrator, because he had assumed a primordial position, except to be possessed by nature, the trees, the ocean, and the clouds in the sky. He imitates their opaque and obscure language and trembles, as Edouard Glissant would say, with them in his continuous attempt to save the world. For him, two plus two equals five, in magical and symbolic thinking. Two plus two equals five because it is not the sum that transparent and simplistic reasoning that is important, but what they stand for the equilibrium of the world. The narrator is a maroon who refuses slavery and takes refuge in the mountain. He's a hogan, a voodoo in voodoo and a hogan in dogon religion. He is a traitor to the progress brought on us by reasoning, which kills and tastes like death. Two plus two equals five. So the poet's world are uh, also equal to the sword of the maroon and the quilombo, and equal to the first that comes out of the mouth of the vengeful Shango, the terrifying Hogan and Elegba. It is this rage that the manifesto mobilizes against poets that sing for the status quo, the machines that have gone too far and have robbed us of our freedom, rendering our lives artificial and making us uh, dead to the, uh, deaf to the cries of nature. For a long time, Césaire's poetry remained a challenge to me because I was drawn to the other Césaire, the essayist and author of Discourse on Colonialism. I believe like Fanon and all the materialist thinkers, Marxists and capitalists alike, that two plus two equals four. 
that the only way to become uncolonized by the West was to master the best tools of the West, i.e. the sciences, and to, be, and to believe in progress. That is until I met Edouard Glissant, who could philosophize through poetry, master science through poetry, and find progress through mythical and poetic reasoning. At first, he initiated me to poetic thinking or, mag or magical, marvelous, and miraculous thinking by investing me with a priori magical power. He just said I have magic uh, without ask asking me. Just as one would assure a child that he could naturally swim and to prove the point, throw it in the middle of a swimming pool. For Gleason, magic is everywhere in small bits and pieces. It is not what they do in circuses. It manifests itself at the moment unexpected, at the most unexpected moments, like being lost in the big city like London, which I was today, or Paris, and suddenly finding yourself face to face at the address you were looking for or like a child that has lost sight of its mother at a crowded train station and finding her standing in front of uh, it after the moment of panic and despair. Thus, in 2008, I took a train with Edouard Glissant and Sylvie Glissant to Paris, uh, from Paris to, South, uh, to, South, to London, uh, Victoria Station, and we were traveling uh, to Southampton to take the uh, the, boat, the ship there because Gleason had heart condition and he could not uh, uh, travel by plane, or at least it was very dangerous for him to, to travel by plane. So we arrived, but we had to walk around that station and look for the, uh, the, the bus stop, and we missed the bus. We missed the bus, and suddenly uh, Edouard made it my problem. He said, well, uh, you have to get us there. Do some magic and get us there. And I, you know, I was puzzled because my, it, 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 in my mind, I was more uh, scientific than Gleason. But Gleason was asking me to do magic, uh, basically. But not to make him nervous, I said, okay, I'll go outside. I went outside. And outside of the Victoria Station, I was uh, just trying to see if I could hire a cab. And somebody called my name. Uh, it was Ger George Shearer that some of you may know here. He's a cultural theorist. Uh, he said, Mancha, Mancha, what are you doing here? You be how long have you been in London? And he didn't call me. So as I was really happy. It's like that child seeing the mother in the crowd in some ways. So I was very happy to see uh, George. And George try first to, to go into cultural studies, literary theory, and all this. I said, no, George, I'm trying to find a way to go to Southampton. I'm really late, you know? And so to make the long story short, he said he, was gonna, he could take me, but he had to go pick up his kids at the kindergarten. And he couldn't, but he called a Somali cab company. And the cab uh, taxi arrived, and I went and got Edouard, and we, uh, we were supposed to be there at 4.30. We got there at 5. Edouard, who's, you know, he's completely relaxed. He said to me again, make some magic. I don't want the boat to leave. Make some magic. So I said, Edouard, you know, I just hope, because, because I was thinking, one, the tickets were un unrefundable, and then two, I could send uh, Edouard and Sylvie back to Paris, and they wait for the following week to catch the bus, uh, the ship, uh, the Queen Mary. And then I'll take it, spend the night in London and uh, take a plane and go back to my teaching. And then I felt really guilty, selfish, and I said, I'm abandoning them. How am I doing this? So my whole thing was at that point to begin to pray, which I don't do, because Gleason had asked me to do magic. So, but anyway, we got there somehow, and the boat was almost leaving. And then the guy said, you have your tickets, you have your tickets, run, run, run. And again, as a Western man, I started running. I forgot that Gleason actually could barely walk uh, at that time, you know. So I realized that, and I stopped and started screaming, wheelchair, wheelchair, wheelchair. And finally, we got on the boat. We got on the boat, 
and it looked like the land was moving away from us, and Gleason looked at Sylvie and, and laughed. He said, I told you, those Africans, they have magic. <laughs> and again, we laughed, but I didn't know, I didn't want to owe it because, you know, of my background that I just told you. And I will conclude this with a quick, I'm supposed to look somewhere to see when I'm running out of time, okay. So I'll conclude this with another train trip that, that freaked me out uh, again. Uh, and this was from Strasbourg to uh, uh, Tejede from Strasbourg to Charles de Gaulle and then go to Athens, Greece, because I'm, I'm making a film there now. Uh, I will begin it again with uh, a, another poem uh, by Césaire. He said, c'est moi, rien que moi, qui arrête ma place sur le dernier train de la dernière vague, du dernier rat de marée. So uh, let me just read the translation quickly to save time. It is I, no one but I, who decides where is my seat on the last train of the last wave of the last tide. And then there is more, but I'm going to save time. Uh, Oh, see, when he try to go fast, then he don't go. <laughs> okay. Uh, so basically, I, I'm in Strasbourg. I was, I was interviewing a woman called Fatou Diom for this opera I'm making uh, on immigration. And then when I was done, my daughter took me, who's the cameraman, she took me to the train station. In my mind, you know, because I'm actually from a primitive era than young generation, I will just go stand in line and retrieve my seat number. So after 30 minutes in line, I got there. The man said, no, uh, you actually need to go to Air France to get your ticket. You are in the wrong line. I said, but it's the same train going to the same place. Why don't you just look in your computer and tell me my seat? He said, no, that's not my job. So he told me, oh, you go out the boulevard, you do this. So make the long story short, we look for the place. And my daughter helped me, everybody helped, but we couldn't find Air France building. So at that point, I made a, a radical decision, a glissantian decision. I'm, I just, I'm just going to jump on that train. I have credit cards. I'm an American. So I began to give myself all kind of courage. So I'm going to just go and sit in that train. So I did that. And then I began to worry. Suppose the, the, uh, the controller comes and says, where is your ticket? And you're not American, you are from Mali. And then they took me out next stop, and I become an immigrant or get charged with some. So I began to do all kind of worries. But surely the controller arrived. And I took my uh, Blackberry out and then showed uh, that I bought the ticket. And he looked at it in my name, and I was sitting in the same seat that was assigned me, in the same car. I was sitting right there. <laughs> so I was sitting. So I began to relax, and I took the sweat off. I began to do all kind of things. Uh, but a, an old couple, mixed couple, a black man about 80, and the woman, they passed me, and the man was dragging a bag. So I was so happy with myself. Unlike everybody else, I just jumped. Well, first, first thing that happened that was really amazing, he was dragging this bag and he came to the train door and he couldn't open it. He tried everything to, to open the door, he couldn't open the train door. Because they always, te uh, technology changes and they change doors, they do all kind of changes. So I just got up and opened it, uh, the door. He didn't thank me, but his wife looked at me so kindly, I was happy. And then they came back again, they're still looking for their seat, they can't find their seat. So I said, can I help you? Finally, he was happy to give me his bag. We look, we find a seat. When we find a seat, so I got my two minutes. I think I'll be okay. Uh, we look and find a seat. And basically, when I put him in his seat, I realized that I left my iPad, my telephone, everything in my seat. But, so my distance from his car to my, uh, my car, I said, well, I don't really care if I lose everything. You know, because I was so happy with myself for having helped the couple. But I went back and found everything, in, everything was on the car again. And 
that's really the story. And I have a lot of conclusions going to Scalor, Le Caesar, and Glissant, but I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you.